many, and we must find a cure. Hey guys, my name's Tomato Anus, also known as a knockoff Burger King foot lettuce guy, and this is a segmented any percent speedrun of Dishonored. This run is actually performed by Seeker, the current any percent world record holder for Dishonored, who also worked with me on writing the commentary for this run and made sure the explanations are as accurate as possible and that I don't say anything stupid. If you would like to watch either this segmented run without commentary, or Seeker's current any percent world record, which is also commentary free, there are links in the description below. Also, with this being any percent, glitches are allowed. If you would prefer to watch a run without glitches, I recommend you watch a run of the legacy category, which is a category that relies much less on glitches than any percent. There's a link in the description to the current world record run performed by Frippic. This run is performed on version 1.2 of the game, which is a downpatched version of the game. Typically, Dishonored speedruns begin by loading a pre-made save of when the player gains control of Corvo, but due to my incessant need to ramble, this run includes the intro cutscene. Just don't be weirded out if you go watch another run and notice that the run begins with loading a save and there being no intro cutscene. When the run begins, Seeker is going to perform what's called an elevator to skip a cutscene with Emily. When you play the game at a relatively high frame rate, jumping backwards while at a 90 degree angle in the environment, like a corner, causes the game to believe you're jumping into a long series of consecutive vaultable objects. By moving backwards and jumping into the 90 degree angle, your character will hit the vertical series of pixels that the game believes to be vaultable objects, and your character will rise to the top of the corner you're jumping into. Now that I've talked about elevators a little bit, let's start the actual run. When we finally gain control of Corvo, Seeker is going to immediately do a sneaky little jump over Jeff Kurnow's head, which is a super small optimization to not get caught on him, but causes a lot of resets when grinding out runs. We're then going to perform the first elevator of the run. Once Seeker rides the elevator up, he drops down onto the railing of the bridge below him, skipping the trigger that you would normally walk through that causes Emily to greet you. Shortly after, we're going to climb some stairs and jump at the top as we enter a cutscene where we greet Sokolov, as he paints a portrait of the guy who played the salesman who tried to sell Kramer a car in Seinfeld and ended up getting taken on one of the longest test drives ever. The reason why we jump at the top of the stairs is that it allows for us to move slightly further than if we were to just continue running, allowing for us to be slightly closer to our destination as we hold F to skip the scene. Seeker also is holding F as the cutscene starts, and since the cutscene technically starts as he's jumping into it, it gives enough time for the cutscene to be about half skipped by the time it starts. From there, we run up to the gazebo where we see the Empress talking with someone cosplaying as Nosferatu. This is the beginning of a series of cutscenes. The first one is relatively short, where after we position ourselves directly in front of the Empress and hand her a letter. It's a fair wind that brings you home to me. What news have you brought? After this, we run over to some shrubbery, one of which is next to an invisible wall which extends high into the sky. Here, we position ourselves and perform another elevator, taking us to an acrophobe's worst nightmare. Up here, Seeker waits until the two assassins spawn on top of the waterlock where we first arrived. Once they spawn, Seeker is going to wait until the assassin on the right blinks for the first time. This is used as a visual cue for Seeker to walk forward and fall from his perch, causing him to take a massive amount of damage and die. Normally when the assassins arrive, the player will fight them off as a combat tutorial for the game. However, Arcane Studios implemented a failsafe should the player die in the tutorial, where it will automatically skip to the next cutscene as if the fight had been completed successfully. By taking enough damage to kill himself, Seeker triggers the failsafe and entirely skips having to fight the assassins. This then begins the cutscene where Dowd appears and momentarily kebabs the Empress. Emily is then kidnapped by Dowd's henchmen and were dropped to the ground almost as hard as I was as a baby. We then briefly console the Empress in her dying moments, before being found and apprehended by Nosferatu and the Seinfeld car salesman. This cutscene ends with us being knocked out by one of the guards, but before he can do so, we're going to begin holding F, which is our key for skipping cutscenes. This is for a glitch called Ari Storage Skip, or ASS for short, named after the person who discovered the trick. If during another cutscene, you either hold F to skip it, or begin holding F like in the case of this unskippable cutscene, and continue to hold it until the next cutscene that you can skip by holding F, the input will be stored and will immediately skip the cutscene. This saves approximately 1.06 seconds. 
You can see this in action by staring at the bottom left corner of the screen after we load into Cold Ridge Prison. Because we're still holding F, the prompt to skip the cutscene will appear and disappear almost immediately, rather than waiting for us to begin holding F and letting the bar fill up all the way. Unfortunately, this doesn't work on every single cutscene, because ASS only works if you don't press any interact keys while holding F, which is unavoidable for certain stretches of gameplay. As worded by several Dishonored runners, pressing an interact key while holding F will break your ass. After skipping the cutscene and being slipped a key by the guard, we will proceed to make our escape by performing a precise skip to the prison door. By standing and looking in a specific spot, we can spam jump quickly by having it bound to our scroll wheel, which will put you up and over the locked door, skipping most of the level. After this, Seeker's fascination with elevators continues as he performs an elevator to go out of bounds in the level. From there, he can run along the roof of the prison and jump into some water, after which he'll run straight to the Dunwall sewers. While Seeker is falling into the water, he's going to crouch while still in the air, as this reduces the distance that he'll travel into the water, making him closer to the surface and able to exit the water quicker. If you've been a fan of elevators so far, I apologize because there are only a few left in the run. The reason for this is that we're going to be getting the blink ability relatively soon, and once we have that, blinking is almost always faster than riding an elevator. Lucky for you elevator stands, there's an elevator as soon as we enter the sewers that will bring us out of bounds. And now, lucky for you out of bounds stands, pretty much the rest of the entire sewers level is out of bounds, as the out of bounds in this area is actually decently solid and allows for us to walk along certain areas and make it to the end. With proper positioning, angling, and scroll jumping, certain jumps can skip the climbing animation entirely. Along the way, we're going to perform what's called the sewers leap, which I'll call out when it's happening by putting a note on the screen. The sewers leap is a trick that's only used once throughout the whole run. While we're out of bounds, we're going to come across a high up ledge that we need to be able to climb over to progress further out of bounds. We're normally not able to climb over the ledge due to how high up it is. However, if you look towards the building across the way, crouch, and spam the jump input with the free scrolling mouse wheel, Corvo will somehow be able to reach the ledge and perform a muscle up if you hold space, allowing us to progress further. After Sewer's Leap, we continue towards the end of the level, vaulting up and over obstacles and being precise with where we jump from in certain spots, to make certain we have enough height to climb up things. Eventually, we drop back in bounds and turn around to hit a trigger before we continue any further, otherwise an NPC won't spawn. All you elevator and out of bounds stands are idiots, because this NPC is who we should truly all stand for. That NPC is Samuel who is the only NPC that gives Vega from Doom a run for his money. Samuel, being the naive sweetheart he is, will take us to the Hound Pits pub to meet the good people he works with. We then begin a long boat ride with our man Sam. If you're unfamiliar with Dishonored, it has a lot of unskippable cutscenes. Like, a lot. I put out a poll on both Twitter and YouTube, asking how we should spend the time during the cutscenes in this video, with the options being, let the cutscenes play out without commentary over them, fast forward through the cutscenes, or read a fanfiction during them. Unfortunately, reading a fanfiction won. However, after trying for a bit to make it work, I just couldn't find a way to actually incorporate a fanfiction into the video and have everything else fit and flow nicely. So instead of reading a fanfiction to you about Pumbaa and Timon from The Lion King hooking up, I'm just going to be fast forwarding through the cutscenes whenever applicable. When we arrive at the pub, we immediately head inside to speak with the totally not suspicious Havelock and Pendleton. Fun fact, Havelock is voiced by John Slattery, who plays Roger Sterling in Mad Men and also Howard Stark in the MCU. When we enter the cutscene with these two dudes, we set up our ass that we'll then use to skip a cutscene with Piero. Piero's as much an artist. After skipping the Piero cutscene, we grab some oil for him and skip the cutscene where he gives us back our mask, setting up another ass. We then speak with Piero and do some quick dialogue skips and the screen begins to fade out. As the game is fading out, we scroll the mouse wheel to enter a ton of jump inputs so that a jump input is entered on the exact frame that we transition to the loading screen for the void. If done correctly, when we wake up in the next section, we warp into the void right away at the origin point coordinates, hitting the trigger to unlock your blink power. This saves about 10 seconds and begins a cutscene where we meet the outsider, which is promptly skipped thanks to our ass. After we speak with the outsider is when the run starts to get really fun, thanks to now having the ability to blink. 
While Seeker blinks around in this segment and for the rest of the run, he is being very cognizant of where he is blinking to in terms of his height off the ground. If he blinks to right above the ground or whatever he will land on, when he lands he won't take damage and there will be no bracing landing animation. However, if he lands a little bit higher, while he still won't take damage, there will be that landing animation losing a little bit of time. Going even higher, like if he blinked really high up, he would both take damage and perform that landing animation losing time. Luckily though, there's a sweet spot in terms of height that he will sometimes blink to that's referred to as a damage cancel. When you fall from that sweet spot height, you'll take damage but not have the landing animation, which saves time if he's unable to blink to directly above the ground. You'll see this utilized at random points throughout the full run. Once Corvo is able to move again, Seeker will immediately pick up the Void Channel Bone Charm, which increases the potency of all our abilities, followed by grabbing about 2,000 coins. From here, Seeker will then blink out of a window and perform a damage cancel to not have the landing animation as he lands next to Piero. At Piero, we buy the Rune, 5 Spring Razors, 10 Remedies, and 3 Grenades. After this, we then level up Agility and equip the Void Channel Bone Charm. We then speak with Havelock and head back to Sam to go to the next mission. On the way back to Sam, we blink above and to the left of a trigger zone to avoid a cutscene with Callista. Once we're back with Sam, we begin another boat ride. The reason we leveled up the agility passive ability a moment ago is for a trick that I'll be referring to as double jump blink. This refers to blinking right after performing a double jump. Blinking conserves your momentum, so for example, if you're falling while you blink, you'll still be falling at the same speed you initially were when the blink finishes. Similarly, if you perform a double jump and blink as soon as you perform the second jump, your upwards momentum will be conserved as the blink finishes, allowing for you to span large distances that would normally not be possible to cross with a normal blink. Double jump blinking is only doable after obtaining the agility passive ability. Double jump blinks are the most optimal way to navigate through many levels since it allows for us to blink as soon as possible after our first blink. A handful of blinks in the upcoming level are actually double jump blinks, so be on the lookout for them. Throughout each level in the game, we're going to be using a lot of mana since we're going to be blinking so much, which means that we're going to be using our remedies to regenerate mana a lot, which means we need to get more remedies pretty often. Thankfully, remedies are scattered all throughout each level, allowing for us to quickly pick them up while we're blinking around. In this level, we pick up two right away, along with a rune that's next to the second remedy. The goal of this mission is to kill the guy who played the car salesman in Seinfeld, which we'll be doing shortly with one of the spring razors we bought. We'll get into the building pretty quickly with blinks and double jump blinks, but in order to get into the room that the guy is in, we're going to perform what's called a slip clip. I'll fully explain what a slip clip is in a second, but for now, it's how Seeker is moving through the door without opening it. After us phasing through a wall and throwing a trap at the guy's feet goes unnoticed, we slip clip out of the room, grab a rune, and then slip clip out of bounds to access a door on the floor below us that will bring us out of this area. On our way back to the boat, we damage cancel one of the blinks and then blink to appear next to Samuel. Despite us only being gone for 60 seconds, he has no doubt that we were able to successfully accomplish the job, and we then head out. Now, the explanation for slip clips. If you stand parallel to a wall or door in Dishonored, and then sprint sideways towards the wall while leaning into it, your head will poke through the wall, allowing you to see what's on the other side. While this is happening, you can then perform a blink to a location on the other side of the wall, allowing you to slip through the wall, hence the slip clip. Also, throughout that entire level and throughout the rest of the run, you may notice Seeker pausing before doing certain actions, like right before he performed the first slip clip. This is typically him waiting for his mana to regenerate. The mana route in this run is really tight and highly calculated, with the amount of mana you have at any given moment being planned out in advance. When we get back on dry land, we blink to go over to Havelock and Pendleton and hold F to quickly skip our chat with them. After that, there's a brief glitch in the matrix as both men notice dust on their right shoulders at the same exact time and brush it off. After the load, we wake up in our bed and damage cancel out of the window and enter the basement of the pub. When we enter the hatch to the basement, we are sure to crouch and slide to avoid interacting with the hanging chain. The door in the basement is locked, but by standing and looking at a specific spot and leaning to the left, we're able to grab the key that's on the other side of the door and progress forward. 
In the tunnels, we use another one of our spring razors to take out the two weepers, followed by grabbing two nearby runes. We then perform a slip clip to go out of bounds underneath the map and trigger a cutscene with Havelock and Pendleton from below, which we promptly skip. This slip clip is pretty difficult due to the fact that the wall is curved. The reason this makes it difficult is that the timing to blink into the wall is really short because your head can't be fully in the wall when you lean towards it. We then return to Samuel for another nice little boat ride. Also, it's worth mentioning that the two runes that we just picked up gave us enough to level up agility in additional time, which increases our overall movement speed. Once we're back in the distillery district, we take the same initial path as when we were last here. This time at the security checkpoint, we have to take the oil out of the generator to power down the wall of light, because this time around, the hitbox of the wall of light is different and we can't just blink above it. From here, we dash on over to the entrance of the Golden Cat bathhouse. Once we're in the Golden Cat area, we make a brief detour to grab a rune and then dash over to the Golden Cat proper and discover a hiding Emily. After skipping a brief cutscene with her, we damage cancel out of the window we came in through and enter the area where the less than safer work activities take place. Our goal here is to kill the Pendleton twins, but their locations are random. Luckily, two lights across the room will indicate where they actually spawned so we will never have to wander around looking for them. In this run, we had good luck and the Pendleton twins spawned in the locations which allow for us to kill them the fastest. The first twin we take out with one of the grenades we purchased, while the other we quickly take out with a spring razor. After taking out both twins, we make our escape to a rendezvous point with Emily and exit to the distillery district. Back in the distillery district, we make our mad dash to the boat to meet up with Samuel again. Upon arriving at the boat, Emily somehow beat us here, and isn't even out of breath, showing that she has great promise to be a speedrunner herself come Dishonored 2. Samuel seems even less impressed with us this time, but that's probably because we were gone for just over 70 seconds this time rather than 60 like last time. After Emily gets escorted away from us, we're then told that Lord Pendleton wants to speak with us briefly. Corvo. After a short chat with him, we head to the pub for another brief powwow, followed by heading back to Samuel to transition into Caldwin's Bridge. At Caldwin's Bridge, our goal is to abduct Sokolov, the painter from earlier who looks eerily like Rasputin. Unfortunately, Sokolov lives way on the other side of town, so it's going to take a lot of blinks to get there. First things first, we immediately perform a slip clip to get through a wall and access the door to enter Drawbridge Way. We have to actually wait at the door though until we get a pop-up indicating that the mission has been updated, because we're actually arriving at the door before Samuel has finished talking. If we enter the door before the new objective pop-up appears, we will softlock ourselves. Also, thanks to having to wait for Samuel to finish talking, we're able to have a bit of our mana regenerated when we enter Drawbridge Way. As we're approaching Drawbridge Way, we also have to blink quickly as to avoid getting hit by the electric turret. At the drawbridge, we make our way to the generators powering the spotlights, which we take out with our second grenade. We then proceed to damage cancel twice on our way to Midrow substation. Our stay in the Midrow substation is short-lived since the entrance to North End is two brief blinks away, but the second one lands us directly on top of a fence which boosts us forward a little bit. North End is probably my favorite stretch of blinks in the game, since we perform four double jump blinks in a row, with each one bringing us higher up. It just looks so freaking smooth. Once we make it to Sokolov's house, we give him a dose of homemade Zolpidem, and proceed to easily carry his body to Samuel, performing the biggest damage cancel of the run. When we initially pick up Sokolov's body, there's a brief period of time where we can still run at full speed, which we utilize to get as close to the stairs as possible. When we arrive back at the pub, we hold F to skip through dialogue quickly, which leads us into another cutscene of Emily waking us up. Once we fully wake up and hide our morning wood, we damage cancel our way outside and blink over to Sokolov, who we briefly interrogate. 
After we skip the initial cutscene with him, we continue to hold F to perform our ass on the second cutscene with him. We then perform a slip clip to exit the room and to avoid having to interact with the door, allowing for us to continue holding our ass and skip the first cutscene with Pendleton. Fittingly enough, this ass to ass section is typically referred to as double ass. Once we make it to the estate district, we perform three double jump blinks to get onto the Boyle estate property and blink over to Lord Shaw, to whom we deliver a letter from Lord Pendleton. We then double jump blink up onto the balcony and enter the Boyle estate itself. During the fade in here, we can actually move, allowing for us to progress a little bit while the screen is still dark. This section has a bit of luck involved as our target is Lady Boyle and there are three Lady Boyles in attendance at the party and we have to kill the correct one. Thankfully, the first one that we kill with a spring razor was the correct one, as confirmed by the letter that we grab afterwards by poking our head through the wall. Upon exiting the estate, we then blink a few times to make it back to the river and rejoin Samuel at the boat to fast forward through some more cutscenes. When we arrive back at the pub, we blink up to Lord Pendleton and have a brief chat with him about the late Lady Boyle, and he informs us that Mr. Stark has something planned for us to do next. After chatting with Stark, we learn that our next target is Nosferatu himself. Equipped with this knowledge, we head back to Samuel and make haste for Dunwall Tower, and we can continue to fast forward more cutscenes. Once we arrive at Dunwall Tower, we park ourselves outside of the waterlock where the game originally began. Here, we blink up the cliff face and perform an elevator to climb up the waterlock building. Once we're on top of the building where we originally saw the assassins that killed the Empress, we perform an enormous double jump blink with an additional blink and damage cancel thrown in before entering Dunwall Tower proper. Our stay in the tower is short-lived, however, as the only reason why we had to enter was to alert the guards, as otherwise the Lord Regent will not go up into his room. Once we're back outside, we blink up to a ledge and sadly perform the final elevator of the run. Seeker then relives his Call of Duty glory days and throws a random frag across the map to kill the Lord Regent, who surely is complaining to his friends in his Xbox Live party about what he's seeing on his kill cam. We then make our quick retreat back to Samuel with a couple damage cancels and double jump blinks, only to find that Samuel is unimpressed that we were gone for 50 seconds. When Seeker threw the nade, he was sure to cook it for just the right amount of time so that the grenade landed directly on top of a wall of light that was protecting Nosferatu and exploded right in front of him. If the grenade wasn't cooked for long enough or was cooked for too long, then Nosferatu wouldn't die from it. When we arrive back at the pub, we begin paying our respects as the boat ride ends to set up our ass. Emily opens the door for us when we enter the pub so our ass is maintained properly, allowing for us to skip the first cutscene of the party. After we begin holding F again to skip the second cutscene of the party, we prepare our ass again for another upcoming cutscene. When we leave the party and blink up to our room, Corvo begins to feel nauseous and collapses. This is when we initiate our ass and skip the first cutscene quickly and then manually skip the second one where Samuel checks to see if we good. When we skip this cutscene, we continue to hold F to prime our ass in anticipation for the last one in the game. It's at this point where we begin the longest cutscene in the game, where we finally meet Dowd, the man who killed the Empress, face to face. During the entire 2 minute and 14 second cutscene, we hold F to keep our ass loaded, all to save those sweet, sweet 1.06 seconds at the end of it. Also, with Dowd being the magician that he is, he somehow confiscates the sword that we never picked up at the beginning and we'll see him perform a magic trick where he makes it disappear again. When the long cutscene finally ends, we're brought to the void, where we continue to hold F and do a double jump to the left as soon as we load in, and finally release our big ass to skip the outsider. When we gain control of Corvo, we're in a small little pit with a rat and a bunch of bricks. Rather than use the bricks to break the barrier above us, we perform the most difficult slip clip of the run. The reason why this clip is so difficult compared to the others is that the wall is curved and we also have to throw in a jump while performing the clip in order to reach the upper platform. If we didn't jump when performing this clip, we would fall under the platform and into the water below us. From there, we blink through the level and perform a couple big boy damage cancels, grab some keys, and head on over to the door to Central Rudshore. 
Our goal right now is to return to the Hound Pits pub and Corvo is more determined than ever. So determined, in fact, that he defies the laws of physics again to slip clip through a wall and then swim slash blink in the dirtiest water known to man just to get to the pub a little faster. Seeker isn't quite done swimming in filth water just yet though. When Seeker exits the tunnel, he's going to be doing several double jump blinks to get through central rud shore as quickly as possible. At one point, he double jumps off of a platform in order to hit the sweet spot for fall distance to perform a damage cancel. After navigating through central Rudshore, we enter the door to the Old Port District outskirts. After loading in, Seeker immediately turns around and performs a slip clip through the thickest door in the run. He then will dive headfirst back into the grimy water. After he lands in the water, he quick saves and quick loads which lowers his FPS to 1. This causes for us to reach the end of the waterway immediately. Once we're back at the pub, we run upstairs and grab a remedy, followed by grabbing some keys to exit the building we were in. We then have to enter the pub itself and split the gap between two guards to read Stark's orders to his guards, where we learn that he's also turned on Piero and Sokolov, framing them as traitors. We then head immediately to a nearby tower and slip clip inside to trigger Samuel's bat signal. Being ever impatient, Seeker blinks into the water and begins swimming to Samuel, who is right around the bend. We have to be sure not to blink too far out into the water though, or else we won't be able to interact with Samuel on his boat. After triggering the dialogue, Samuel continues to row because he's sick of Seeker's shit and moves far enough away that the dialogue stops. Seeker then has to blink once more to get back in range of Samuel to let him know that we need to go to King Sparrow Island to rescue Emily. Samuel obliges and Seeker performs what's called the Finzy Fast Fadeout, which is commonly referred to as FFF. With this specific dialogue with Samuel, if you quick save and then quick load, it will cause for Samuel to finish his dialogue instantly and the fade out to begin earlier. When the boat ride ends, we say our goodbyes with Samuel and promise to say goodbye to Emily for him. It's been a long road and we've all really bonded with Samuel. I think we can all say that we've developed a deep and everlasting bond with Samuel after today and Seeker just straight up kills him for having quote, wasted my time by navigating too slowly, it's a speedrun goddammit. The heartless bastard now begins his final push to end the game and the run. Seeker proceeds to blink, double jump blink, and damage cancel his way all the way to the elevator on the other side of the island where he'll take a ride all the way up to the burrow's lighthouse. Once Seeker arrives at the top, he'll blink his way all the way to the top of the lighthouse and snag the key to Emily's room from Mr. Stark, who's busy monologuing. The run officially ends when Seeker uses the key to unlock Emily's door. If you managed to make it to the end of this video, I'd like to say thank you for sticking around from both myself and on Seeker's behalf. I highly encourage you guys to drop a follow for Seeker if you haven't already. He truly is an amazing human being and also one of the most skilled speedrunners I've ever been able to watch. Without him, this video wouldn't have been possible. On a side note, I'd also like to say thank you for the support you've all shown recently, especially as we slowly transition away from strictly Fallout content on this channel. We recently passed 75,000 subscribers, which honestly has left me at a loss for words. When I first started making speedrunning content, I didn't think 75 subscribers would be a possibility, let alone 75,000. I just wanted to say thank you for your continued support, and I appreciate you immensely. Going forward, I plan on continuing to make speedrun videos on other speed games like this one on Dishonored in our last video on Doom 2016. If you have any suggestions or recommendations for speedruns you'd like to see covered, please leave me a comment below. Anyways, that's all for this video. I hope you enjoyed. Until next time. I've been Tomato Anus, and I hope you have an above average day. And decades hence, when your hair turns white.